Thank you very much. Um, it is really a, a great pleasure and a privilege for me to have been afforded this um, rare opportunity to address the members of this very noble and prestigious debating society, the Oxford Union. And I'm also glad to have been afforded the opportunity to come back to the city and the University of Oxford, a place which brings back many precious memories of my childhood. My late father was a proud alumnus of Corpus Christi College, where he read PPE and then followed that up with law. And during the 70s, when my father was a mature student, I spent many happy half terms here in Oxford visiting him. It is therefore rather fitting then that today, as I've been asked to reflect on my journey and experience as King of Lesotho, that I should foreground his reign, which served as the foundation and the formative context of my own. I will, however, start by giving a brief history of Lesotho and its monarchy, because the role requires an embodiment and an awareness of that history. It is indeed, I believe, an office and an institution that is not frozen in time, but is instead changing current and of the times. Around the first quarter of the 19th century, a sizable part of Southern Africa was plagued by violent upheavals and wars, where different chiefdoms and clans were attacking each other and fleeing from one another. And as a result, an avalanche of refugees was unleashed across the region. Our history books refer to these wars and upheavals as Difakani. During this period of Difakani, a clan called Baguina had a chief by the name of Leporco, who later became to be known as Mushesh who skillfully protected his clan and chiefdom against the severest effects of the upheavals, and who also managed to bring many of the refugees under his protection. Within a relatively short period of time, many clans and chiefdoms recognizing Mushashre's leadership skills, conferred their loyalty and allegiance to him, and soon saw themselves as one nation of Basotho, of the polity of Lesotho, owing allegiance to one great king, what we call in Sesotho, Morena Emohoro. 
It is worth noting that Mushreshre earned this loyalty not just because of his strength and courage as a warrior, but more importantly, through his exceptional political and diplomatic skills, and also through his enormous capacity to perform acts of charity, clemency, and compassion towards his people. This ethic and vision continues to guide Lesotho's monarchy to this day. From around 1824, Lesotho became a centralized state with a hierarchy of political authorities where Mugane Muholo Mushoeshwe exercised executive authority over his people and country. The growth and development of this young nation was interrupted in the 1830s when white settlers of Dutch descent, who we refer to as the Boers, escaping British rule in the Cape Colony, began migrating northwards and encroaching on Basutu territory. For years, Basutu defended their territory against these intruders. But Moshe eventually realized that he could, know he could not keep them at bay forever. So in order to save the territory that was still left, he sought protection from the British Crown. And after that request was granted, Lesotho became a British protectorate in 1868. Kim Mushreshre died two years later in 1870. And one of the legacies of this period is that skillful navi navigation of trade-offs in search of the greater good for the people. The monarchy which continued to command the people's allegiance remained agile in the face of various forces, including colonialism. By the time Lesotho gained its independence from Great Britain in 1966, the monarchy had become a constitutional monarchy. It is against this backdrop that my father reigned. As a young prince, I witnessed him lead in the midst of political change, and I saw how the politics of the day affected the institution of the monarchy. Throughout his tenure as paramount chief from 1960 to 1965, and as king and head of state after independence, my father, King Mushoshe II, along with a sizable proportion of Basuto citizens, often challenged the relevance of a British model of constitutional monarchy to Basuto people. His views inevitably created tension between himself and the then elected Prime Minister, Chief Labua Jonathan, who was adamant that the king should reign as a constitutional monarch in accordance with the Westminster system and rules. There seemed to be a lack of interest to draw on the insights of political institutions that preceded colonialism on the side of our post-independence political elites. 
After a political and constitutional crisis in 1970, Prime Minister Labua Jonathan went on to rule as an, an Ali elected head of government for another 16 years before he was toppled by a military coup in January 1986. The new military regime installed a six-man military council to oversee a mainly civilian cabinet. My father, who was heartened by the inclusion of civilians, hoped that he could work together with the new government to create a political environment that could usher in a new democratic dispensation that Basuto sorely needed. Unfortunately, as time went on, serious disagreements emerged between my father and the chairman of the military council, Major General Lakhanya, as my father called for more decisive action against corruption. Relations deteriorated so badly that in early 1990, the chairman of the military council had three of his colleagues who he regarded as allies of my father arrested. Some members of the Council of Ministers were dismissed and my father was sent into exile to the United Kingdom. Even in exile, tensions continued to grow, culminating in the promulgation of several military decrees that removed my father from the throne and placing me as king in his stead at the age of 27. To this day, that incident remains one of the most painful experiences of my life. I say this because what happened in November 1990 is completely alien to our culture. In Susutu custom, it is an abomination for a son to occupy the throne while the father is still alive. Although that situation troubled my family and I, we agreed that I should hold the position until the rightful order could be restored. Because of a great deal of pressure from within the country and also from the international community, the military government eventually agreed to enter into negotiations with my father in London under the auspices of the Commonwealth Secretary General. These negotiations paved the way for my father's return to Lesotho in July 1992, almost a year ahead of the 1993 general elections, which ushered in a democratically elected government. We all had high hopes that the new government would want to undo the wrongs of the military government and reinstate my father to his rightful throne. Most regrettably, our calls for justice were met with intransigence. Of course, as a family, we were happy to have my father back in the country, even though he was yet to be reinstated. I remained concerned about the impact of that anomalous situation on the institution of the monarchy. And consequently, I exercised what I would call my traditional prerogative as king to restore the rightful order. I did this by taking the bold and radical, perhaps once in a lifetime action of dissolving parliament and dismissing the government. The resultant crisis triggered a series of events that ultimately restored legitimacy, integrity, and dignity to the monarchy. As expected, the interventions that ensued 
led to the reinstatement of both the government and the rightful monarch, His Majesty King Mushashu II. A year later, in January 1996, tragedy struck the family and the nation when my father died in a car accident in the mountains of Lesotho. As a result, at the beginning of February, I took the oath of office and ascended to the throne. But this time, my ascension to the throne was in accordance to our laws and customs. It does seem that in each generation, the question of the role of the monarchy is raised in new and politically relevant ways. One example of this is that two years later, in 1998, in a disputed election, the opposition parties cried foul and mounted protest action against the ruling party. In so doing, they came and camped at the palace gates and refused to budge. They explained that they had come to ask the king, who they called the father of the nation, to listen to their grievances about a rigged election. I should explain that the father of the nation is a traditional title that Basotho bestow on their king, particularly during difficult times when they seek solutions or guidance from him. This is what used to happen in the old times of Mushreshwe and his successors. Even with the modern institutions of arbitration and conflict resolution, in this time of crisis, some looked to the monarchy to address their grievances. As this conflict continued, and the protesters were forced to vacate, to vacate the palace gates, a large portion of the crowd burst through the palace gates and took refuge within the palace grounds, with some even going into the palace itself, where they spent the night in the palace foyer. The opposition protesters camped in and around the palace grounds for almost three months, only leaving after political parties and the mediating body of the Southern African Development Community signed an MOU that delivered a political settlement. In this modern context, the monarchy was a sanctuary. To many, it seemed as though after episodes of political turbulence, the monarchy could provide stability. As I look back on my 26 years as king, I can say I have sought to uphold the Constitution as an important element that has been grafted into an institution with deep historical roots. Remaining faithful to the rule of law, captured in both our historical customs and our current laws, has served as a compass to help me navigate the complex situations I have often faced. In my role today, it is clear that in order to best serve the people, I must embrace both progress and tradition and actively live in the tension of the future and the past. Thank you for your attention.
Majesty, thank you so much thank for joining you. us. Let's begin with what you uh, spoke about in your address about how you, uh, as a monarch, are able to uphold tradition and also embrace the modernity of the 21st century. How have you gone about doing that and what is your hope for the C2 in, in the next sort of 10 years? Um, well, as I said, it, it has not been easy. Uh, we've gone through very, very difficult times um, over the years. Um, but um, I have recognized that um, I am a constitutional monarch in Lesotho, a Lesotho of the 21st century. Um, but at the same time, the institution that I represent and the seat that I hold or occupy has uh, historical roots and traditions. Uh, so it has been a tricky um, exercise on uh, balance to uh, to be to keep uh, modern and to be progressive and keep up with the times, while at the same time uh, being loyal uh, to the traditions of, of, of the monarchy. But uh, I, I think I have managed. This is not easy. Uh, it's something that uh, I cannot, I have not done alone. I seek advice. I talk to people, uh, family members and other people to help me, advise me, and to see how the, uh, these two competing, sometimes competing uh, elements uh, and competing forces uh, can, can work together for the advantage uh, of the institution and for the advantage of, 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 of the people. And what's your vision for Lesotho over the next 10 years? Well, I want Lesotho to be a thriving democratic uh, state, democratic kingdom. Um, uh, I want, uh, I would like, and I hope uh, it will uh, materialize, I would like uh, Lesotho to be economically uh, prosperous, where our economy uh, can strengthen to such an extent that it can provide uh, jobs uh, for those young people who are unemployed, loitering in the streets, looking for jobs, and uh, just provide uh, general welfare for the larger uh, proportion of the population. And Your Majesty, the Sutu has faced high unemployment economic collapse, um, a weak currency over your time in power and before. Um, an African Union report called for the economic integration of the Sutu with South Africa. How does the idea of an integrated Lesotho resonate with you? Well, is, is that an African Union report? I wasn't, <laughs> I wasn't aware. Uh, but I, of course, I'm aware that uh, it, within Lesotho, uh, admittedly within the Lesotho, a lot of or some of our people have that view that uh, Lesotho and Basotho would be better served if we were part of a greater uh, uh, economy if we're part of a bigger country, uh, South Africa. But um, um, from what I hear and what I see on the ground, the majority of the people are still very proud uh, of uh, our heritage, the country that uh, small as it is, uh, poor as it is, uh, that has been bequeathed uh, to us by our forefathers and uh, they would like to keep uh, Lesotho as an independent sovereign state. Uh, having said that, um, I think uh, a lot of people, me included, would want to uh, engage in, in um, dialogue with our big neighbor, South Africa, to see how we can uh, create uh, agreements and structures that can help uh, Lesotho to be more prosperous as an economy, 
and more viable uh, as as uh, uh, as an economy and uh, and as a country. So uh, we should. Um, I feel that we should remain as an independent state, but uh, uh, we, sh we at the same time engage uh, in negotiations with uh, our neighbors to see how we can work together that, uh, and Lesotho should become uh, a more uh, prosperous and viable economic entity. And how does your role as a recognized standard bearer for the Catholic faith in Africa affect the way that you conduct yourselves in public life? As a as a sort of standard bearer for the Catholic faith? Well, well I wouldn't describe myself a standard bearer. Of course, uh, I'm a Catholic. I've grown up uh, in the Catholic Church, uh, and I'm a practicing Catholic. Uh, uh, and um, I, I, as a Christian, uh, uh, um, a lot of, of what I do on a daily basis is, is guided. By, 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 by my faith, uh, not only just as a Catholic, but generally speaking, uh, as, 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 the, uh, as, as, a, as a Christian. Mm. And uh, the rise in China and Russia have affected the global power dynamics in Africa, something which is interesting considering that at the time of the millennium, we considered, I think, the, the 2000s as, as the, 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 the century of Africa. Uh, to what extent do you think that aid has become a sort of trap of debt dependency and neocolonialism? Um, well, I'm not an expert uh, in that. In, in, in that, and many uh, books and articles have been written uh, about um, the the dangers uh, of of aid and actually the harm that uh, aid over the years has, has uh, caused uh, uh, yeah, our, our countries, our, particularly the developing countries. Uh, but I, as not an, uh, being um, a layman and not an, 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 an economist, I really cannot give you a definitive, de definitive answer and say this is the case I agree or disagree. Uh, but I know the, the, the debate is, is there um, and people will continue to debate the issue. Um, but um, we, we, we'll see what, what, uh, how, how things pan out. And where do you think the Sutu will find itself in the rising tensions between East and West? Well, um, the Sutu is open to everybody. Um, we are friends with we have good relations with the People's Republic of China. We have good relations with the West, uh, the European countries, the EU, and the, 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 the American, uh, even the United States of America, and other North American countries. Um, so we, we do, um, do uh, are open to do business with any, with any country, as long as it, uh, serves the, the, the interest of, of, of our people. And in the last two years, we've seen an increase in, uh, in our own country, of sort of a global outlook. And um, amongst that, we've seen huge protests for Black Lives Matter. Do you feel that that's affected the way that the West and the world views African countries, especially smaller nations? Um, the, 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 the protests of, of- The Black Lives Matter protests and uh, the sort of general, I think, more global awareness that's come out of COVID. Yeah, I, th I think. Um, well, I, I've I've seen. Uh, I've been uh, far away in Southern Africa in Lesotho, and I've seen the uh, the movement of Black Lives Matter, uh, and I know um, um, uh, a lot of our people in that region have uh, uh, found something in common. With, with that with that with that with that movement uh, but I cannot specifically say how it has affected uh, Lesotho or Basotho people uh, but uh, it it's the only thing I can say is that um, uh, I'm glad that um, uh, the issue uh, that black lives matter movement raise raises uh, is now uh, you know in the uh, public arena uh, and I hope people can take attention 
And um, th those issues can be addressed, issues of racism, discrimination, uh, can be addressed and taken seriously by all. So we, uh, even in Lesotho, that's what we would want to happen. And let's talk about COVID-19. Mm. Could you talk to us about your experience as a world leader having to navigate the pandemic? Um, is, they, they will probably, you know, um, the, it would be easier for, 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 for the government uh, in Lesotho to answer these, uh, some of these questions, particularly that one. But uh, I have, in Lesotho, I've, uh, I have observed uh, and seen how COVID-19 has impacted uh, the, the economy. Uh, it has been a very difficult time. Um, uh, a lot of people have lost their jobs. Uh, a lot of businesses have gone under and it's the same almost every, everywhere across the world. Uh, it is just that un uh, it is unfortunate that uh, we, in, in, in the fight against COVID-19, we, we received the, uh, the a major weapon, which is the vaccines, uh, rather late in the day. Um, we would have preferred to get them uh, earlier uh, in, 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 in the fight, but um, we have vaccines now and uh, people are getting vaccinated. And so that will help, but the economy will take a long time to, to recover. And Your Majesty, as a constitutional monarch, how do you cope with the pressures of being a royal and in, in the public eye, bearing the weight of, uh, I suppose, responsibility, being an example to your people? Well, I think I've been, I've coped quite well. Um, I, I, I was saying to a, a group of students elsewhere earlier on today that uh, I'm very fortunate uh, the pressures uh, that I see other, particularly in Europe, other fam royal families, the, the pressures that they, they live under. I, I don't live, and me and my family, we don't live under the same kind of pressures. So I'm relatively free uh, to move around uh, the Soto and to mingle with ordinary people. So um, I, I, I really don't have the kind of uh, burdens and pressures that uh, other, other monarchs uh, uh, suffer under. So uh, in that regard, I'm, I'm, very, I'm very blessed and happy that that is the case. Well, I'd like to leave some time for audience questions. If you have a question, could you raise your membership card? I recognize the member on the front bench just here. Mike, thank you. Thank you, Her Majesty, for speaking with us this evening. Um, I believe you said had a very good case for the role of the monarchy in domestic affairs. What would you say the role of the monarchy is in the foreign relations of your country? Well, I, I can only uh, speak for Lesotho. Um, of course, uh, the issues of, of foreign affairs are handled by the government uh, and the foreign ministry. But uh, my role as, as a monarch uh, in Lesotho is to, with in cooperation and with the guidance of my government, is to promote Lesotho uh, and to promote Basotho um, and to, um, as much as possible, to let the world, the rest of the world know that uh, Lesotho exists. Uh, and uh, whenever we need assistance, sometimes uh, it is uh, me that uh, have to, to go out and, 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 uh, uh, and seek assistance. So, but again, uh, I don't do that. Uh, uh, I don't go out on a tangent and do things by myself. I do it uh, within uh, the scope of what the government of the day uh, and what the priorities of, of the government, uh, the pri the, what the, uh, the priorities are of the government of the day. Thank you. And I recognize the member in the plaid shirt at the back. So given Lesotho's uh, legacy of diplomacy stand. over the years, oh, sorry. Thank you. Given uh, Lesotho's legacy of diplomacy over the years, 
how do you balance the acute need for your biggest neighbor, South Africa, dealing with, say, their water crisis, with your ambition of doing business with logistical neighbors that are far away, such as Swaziland, Mozambique, Botswana, that might be able to use many of these resources, but are confined by this big neighbor that has you tied in? I'm not sure I got, I got that. Uh, how do you manage um, balancing sort of the relations with the, with your neighbor, South Africa, with maybe the ambitions for relations with other neighbors further afield? Is that yeah, exactly. So with being it? confined by South Africa, how are you able to do business with your neighbors like Swaziland, Mozambique, Botswana, while still uh, understanding the needs of your acute neighbors, South Africa, and the water crisis that you might hold over them? Um, well, let me try to address the issue of water. Uh, because that's a very important uh, uh, matter. We have a, a project, a binational project, between Lesotho and South Africa called the Lesotho Highlands Water Project, where the two countries have agreed that Lesotho will, will supply water. They've built, that we've built dams up in the mountains uh, when we're supplying water to, to, to South Africa on a, on a, on a daily basis and we, we, get, we, get, we get compensated. And there's a treaty uh, that regulates that uh, agreement. Um, so it, it, it does not um, prevent us, uh, if we eventually wanted to, uh, to enter into agreements with Botswana, for example. And I think uh, there is something in the pipeline um, that um, we will probably agree on uh, to also supply water uh, to Botswana. So whatever we do with South Africa on the water, uh, the, the treaty that we have now does not prevent us from doing uh, water deals with, uh, with, um, with, uh, with other countries. But of course, uh, as you know, under international law, because the water that flows from uh, from the Soto will flow into South Africa and Namibia. We have to let everybody uh, and, uh, make, make them aware what's happening with, 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 with the water upstream. Um, but uh, as with other trade matters, we, it's, it's a very amicable, I would say we have a very amicable relationship, uh, particularly those four countries, the Soto, South Africa, Eswatini, uh, in fact, five, uh, Botswana and Namibia are all members of, of the Southern, Southern African Customs Union. So we, 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 we work together within that uh, uh, organization. And I call upon the member just in front in the green. Um, thank you very much, Your Majesty your presentation. Um, I come from the old kingdom of Ethiopia, where His Imperial Majesty Haile Selassie, I failed uh, 1974 to transition to constitutional monarchy. Um, and as I stayed here in England as well, people are still struggling to understand the legacies of monarchies, to understand the current modern world. And as we have seen in Iswatini as well, people are still asking what role still monarchies can play now or even moving forward? What benefits does a nation have still having a constitutional monarchy, especially as we continue to struggle with the legacies of monarchies? So if you can just give us some advocacy or more. So can you, can, can, the, the last part, can you, what's the question? So the, the question is what benefits can a nation still have in your view to continue to have constitutional monarchies Mon mm. as we continue to struggle with legacies of monarchies at large. Thank you. Well, as again, I can only speak for Lesotho. Um, and um, I think uh, as far as I'm aware, um, now and even for the foreseeable future, the majority of the people of Lesotho uh, still value um, the, the institution of the monarchy. They see it uh, uh, as a, a symbol of unity. Um, and 
It is something that, that, that they cherish. And although uh, in a practical sense, there's nothing uh, on a daily basis that um, uh, I do to, to, to sort of, uh, as I say, unlike governments where to, to implement programs or economic uh, programs. But um, uh, the, the, the value which I think the Lesotho monarchy still holds and has is that um, it is very much seen by the people uh, as a, a symbol uh, of, of national unity uh, and a symbol of the, the state of, of, of Lesotho. So as far as Lesotho is concerned, that is where the, uh, the value lies. And the last two years have been some of the most tumultuous internationally many of us have seen. Have you found that role useful, particularly then? Do you feel that you were, I suppose, able to bring extra value to, to Lesotho as, as we face the pandemic and, and all of the chaos that came with it? Yes, I think so. I would like to think that um, uh, during times of crisis, um, the, the monarchy is there as uh, uh, something that um, can give people hope. Um, and as, uh, as I said, it's, it's, it's a symbol of, of, of unity. And I would like that to think that um, uh, uh, during these last couple of years when t times were difficult, uh, uh, people, whatever I have said from, from the throne and whatever I do, does give people hope and, and, and inspires uh, the majority of the people. Um, I recognise the member on the end of this bench here. Um, what do you think the greatest challenge of your reign has been? Sorry? What do you think the greatest challenge of your reign has been? The greatest challenge? Yeah. Yes. Uh, um, yeah, it's... it's um, it's a difficult one. Well, of the, 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 the biggest challenge um, I have found, uh, as I said, as a constitutional monarch, uh, is that um, we are still within the country, there's still a large uh, proportion of the people who would want uh, me to um, help out uh, and intervene um, in, in, in difficult times. Uh, because traditionally, that's what uh, the role, uh, that's what the king does. Uh, but uh, now being a constitutional monarch, there's, there are no um, constitutional or legal instruments available that uh, uh, allow me to, to act in, in that way. So it's, I find it challenging sometimes when that happens. Uh, and I feel that they, there isn't a, 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 a great deal that I, uh, I can do to, to, to help. So uh, that, I would say, would be one, one of the, the biggest challenges. And there are other challenges which I... I face from time to time, but I think that one would be a major one. And I recognize the number just next, next to you. Thank you, Your Majesty. Um, has there been anyone who has any constitutional monarchs or world leaders that have inspired you uh, throughout your reign? You, you grew up in Britain, so you'll be very familiar with uh, our own queen's uh, reign. So has anyone inspired you or um, showing you, giving you be, uh, an example of uh, what it is meant to be to be a constitutional monarch? Uh, well, um, as you said, I've grown up in Britain and I have observed uh, how uh, Her Majesty the Queen has conducted herself and how um, uh, faithful she has been uh, to to her office uh, and to the people and how diligent and determined she is in, in, in 
the performance of her duties. So I've admired how, how Her Majesty uh, carries out her, her, her duties. And uh, one would say, yes, it's, she has been uh, inspirational. Um, but um, the, I also draw inspiration not only from monarchs, but from other, other people, uh, other leaders uh, that I see or read about uh, in the past or even in, in, in the, in currently. So uh, I try to, to, to draw inspiration from uh, various kinds of people, not just uh, uh, monarchs uh, of uh, people I'm in the same situation or the same position with. I want to take one final question. Um, I recognise the member just on the front bench there. Thank you so much, Your Majesty. Um, my question was, as a monarch, how, um, what characteristics constitute a good monarch? Like, what would Sorry? you say? What characteristics what? constitute a good monarch? <laughs> yeah. Um... I don't know. I mean, <laughs> I honestly, as I said at the, at the end of my statement, uh, for me, I found that um, it, being faithful uh, to the rule of law, to the constitution, uh, has, has served me well. Uh, but beyond that, I think uh, one has to try to listen uh, to the people. Uh, although we are not, uh, monarchy by its nature is not something that is, uh, is not a democratic institution. Uh, but even then, particularly, even, particularly in the sort of where uh, the roots of the institution is so much based on what the people decided all those years ago. So you have to keep your ear on the ground on what people are thinking and what people are saying. Uh, and, and, and so that uh, uh, in what you do and in what you say, uh, is uh, you try your best to that uh, it is, uh, falls within the wishes of what the majority of the people want and what the majority of the people aspire for. So basically that's how I, I would answer that, uh, that question. Well, Your Majesty, thank you so much for joining us. We'll finish with a question that we ask all of our speakers. If you could give our audience members one thing to take away and think about for this week, what would that be? Sorry? If you could give our audience members now one thing to take away and think about for this week, what would that be? For this week? Yes. <laughs> oh, they can, they can think about it for longer if they like. Uh, um, well, I, I don't know what, what uh, you, we... we uh, I, can, I, I can... I'm not sure what I can give you as, as something to chew on for the rest of, for the, rest of the week, but... Um, uh, you know, we, we, we live in interesting times. We live uh, in an era of um, uh, conflict. Uh, as you are very much aware, there's uh, uh, dangers of greater conflict uh, here in Europe, in Eastern Europe, between uh, Russia and Ukraine that has caused so much uh, tension. Uh, even on the continent uh, of Africa, there are, there are pockets of, of uh, tension and conflict. We have conflict in Ethiopia, we, we have conflict in West Africa, and so on and so forth. So, um, one, I think, as young people and as, as, as future leaders, uh, we, I would like you to think about uh, how uh, in, 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 in the future, in the in, uh, medium and long term, we can find a way of once and for all uh, finding peace between all the nations of the world 
uh, I know it's, it's a difficult issue because uh, countries uh, from the beginning of time have had competing interests. Uh, and as a result, there's always been friction and conflict. But uh, one would like to think with the experiences that we have had uh, in our lifetime and in the lifetimes of our forefathers, our grandfathers, that really as humanity, we have to find uh, a better way of sorting out uh, uh, our differences so that we can uh, le live in peace and harmony uh, on, on this on 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 this on on this uh, earth, uh, uh, without having to to resort to threat of force of arms. So basically, that's what I would uh, leave you with to think about and see how uh, we can live in peace. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us, and please join me in thanking His Majesty.